Um, okay. And welcome back to Phuket in Focus. It's hard to imagine a person with as much journalistic experience around the world and especially in the region than our next guest. David Armstrong has worked for Murdoch, he's worked for Packer, he's worked for some of the me biggest media groups around the world and also a wealth of knowledge of journalism experience here in Southeast Asia. David Armstrong, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Tim. It's good to see you. How long have you been in Southeast Asia working? Oh, all up, about uh, a dozen years, I guess. One thing that strikes me now that I've been working in the region for the last year or so is that there's a subtlety to the, the journalism in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, and Singapore, and Malaysia, and Thailand that we're not used to in the West. And how would you describe those yeah. differences? There's some uh, differences. The, a lot of the journalism in, uh, in the region is pretty safe kind of journalism. It's very straight and up and down and um, a lot of our hard, don't ask too many hard questions, maybe they're afraid of upsetting their subject. But sometimes you get the feeling that the journalist actually knows a bit more than they're quite saying. And you have to sort of read between the lines a bit to, um, to, to get the full picture. Yeah. And um, it takes a bit of experience, I think. Um, I sometimes think that kind of uh, reading between the lines approach is not, not necessary. Um, I think uh, in a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, the journalists have more freedom than, than they believe they have. Yeah. And I think that's true in Thailand. I think by and large, they don't push the boundaries hard enough in Thailand to find out where the real boundaries are. There are a couple of exceptions, but by and large, uh, it's a bit softer than it need needs to be. You were speaking at uh, IBAP a few nights ago, yes. and one of the questions to you was about uh, sort of the litigious ways of some of the, uh, the, the Thai business people and the governments. Uh, is it as big a worry as we think, or do we sometimes have too much fear when it comes to writing in Thailand? I think, I think there's, uh, the writers hold back too much. Um, they anticipate the problems rather than, rather than working, working through them to see how much you can get away with. They anticipate a problem and draw back rather than pushing and, and perhaps getting some legal advice, how far can you go. That said, um, in Thailand, uh, the penalties for defamation are much, uh, much tougher yeah. than, than we're used to in the West. I'm, penalties for defamation in the US, for instance, are almost nothing. Yeah. But um, in uh, most Western countries, if you're found uh, guilty of defamation, you, you get a, you, you or your newspaper cops a financial penalty. Yeah. Um, here, you can also Go to cop jail. jail or if you're a foreigner, de be, be deported. Yeah. But in some ways, though, it's a restriction on the way. And I even know as journalism here in Phuket where the writing tends to be more creative writing than real journalism because of this fear that they're going to be sued all the yes, time. Yes, there's that. Um, and also there's a, a kind of creative writing which is reporting what people hope will happen rather than what has actually happened. Yeah. And you get that a lot in uh, political reporting in Thailand, I think. Well, how would you rate uh, the, the two big papers in Bangkok here in Thailand, The Nation and The Bangkok yeah. Post? Look, they're both, um, they're both pretty solid papers. Um, I think the Bangkok Post is a little bit more reliable, a little more straight up and down than the nation, which I think politically engages in the kind of creative writing we've been talking about rather more than Bangkok Post does. Um, but they're both pretty solid papers. They hold their own uh, against papers in the, in the region, and um, they're not quite as uh, vigorous or as robust as um, newspapers in Western capitals. But in terms of the region, they're pretty solid. I think um, that the best paper pound for pound, as it were, in the region, best English language paper is Phnom Penh Post, which is only a very small paper, um, just 24 tabloid pages every day, but it does a lot of uh, investigative reporting. Uh, it, it challenges government, it reports things, um, sort of scandals and bribery scandals, uh, illegal logging, which is a very dangerous thing to report in Cambodia because yeah. it's uh, run by people who, uh, who kill people to get in their road. And uh, they're very, it's very tough and vigorous paper. I noticed when I was there about six months ago um, for some of the genocide tribunals that the reporting in the Phnom Penh Post was uh, second to none, and they were yeah. quite yes. pretty vigorous. Yes, yes, and it's a, it's a, that's a difficult one because on the one hand it's a set of legal procedures and you have to follow the rules of legal reporting, which which are their own restrictions. On the other hand, I think it's fairly plain that the uh, 
to Cambodian government would prefer that these these trials weren't going on. Yeah, mm. they have to happen though. They have to happen, yeah. and and let's hope for the sake, sake of the victims that they can get some uh, some progress on them. But the Cambodian government has been a little bit less than uh, cooperative. Before we look forward, let's have a quick look back. Yes. Uh, if you're going to, to try and pick out a highlight of your journalistic career, where would you be looking? Oh boy, very hard one. Very hard one. Um, Oh, we ask hard-hitting questions. Yeah. Yes, look, there, there, there were some big, big kind of set piece things. You know, covering, covering the uh, Olympics in Sydney, you know, it was a, almost a hometown paper. It was pretty big, um, and um, it was a defining moment in Australia, wasn't yes, it? Yes, uh, it was. It was really, it was wonderful. Sydney changed for only, for only about three weeks. Sydney became a nice place to be, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, even. If you're running for a bus, the bus driver will wait for you, which doesn't happen in normal times. Yes. That stuff. Um, but for, for but a nation that, uh, in some ways, Australia, uh, a, a very short history, a very young country, and as an Australian, we sort of think, what, what are we? Are we Vegemite? Are we Lamingtons? Uh, how do you describe an Australian? And I think yeah. the Sydney Olympics somehow galvanised in that opening ceremony mm -hmm. uh, exactly what it was to yes. be Australian. Yes, which was uh, pretty creative. Pretty irrever irreverent, yeah, and uh, pretty forceful, yeah. Um, yeah, lively, exciting, and I think the the Sydney Olympics, as I said in the IBAB presentation, was the best Olympics. Uh, each Olympics is meant to be the best Olympics ever. Sydney was the best Olympics ever until London last year. Yeah, they were amazing. Um, the opening ceremonies for the Olympics are, I suppose, a set piece for the countries that are putting them on. And I think China used theirs very yes. well too. Yes. Um, Anyway, we're moving away from uh, the okay. topics. Let's talk about the future because there's been a huge shift in journalism. Uh, the model that we were used to for hundreds of years with print and press has changed radically and uh, technology is leading the way. Yes. Are the pa papers keeping up? The papers are struggling. Um, the, the, the model is, with the digital media is so different that no one really quite knows how, how you work and how you make it work and how you make money, uh, which is a pretty critical question because it's not just an issue of whether the company makes money, the issue for, for the readers and potential readers is who's going to pay for the journalism. You want to hire a journalist who's an expert reporter, uh, who, or expert political commentator or business commentator, they're, you know, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to hire those kind of people. Um, when the internet first, first came uh, as a threat to newspapers and the newspapers really didn't know how to respond and they got led down a, a bit of a garden path of, of putting all their information up for free. Now there are reasons for that. One was, that it, it, and we tend to forget this, in the 1990s the ethos that the internet is free was incredibly strong. So it was very hard to start charging people on the internet, except you know, unless you're a porn site, basically. Yes. Uh, the New York Times even tried to, to be a charge, a uh, you know, paid for site, and, and, and they failed. And Murdoch tried it um, yes. with the uh, with the Daily. Yes, that failed. That's, that's failed. That's a, a, a complete a complete uh, iPad app paper yes. that's failed. Um, so the newspapers were, had their websites. They were free. So they, that was, that in turn was eating into their newspaper circulation. As far as the readers were concerned, there are now thousands of thousands of sources of information and news. So that was eating into their newspaper circulation and there's no, no real way of fighting back. The thing that galvanised everyone, I think, was the Great Recession of, you know, four or five years ago, um, because they just whacked newspaper finances so hard they had to start doing something. And the New York Times um, led the way, I think, with, with what they call a metered website. So after you read uh, 10 pages a month, if you want to keep reading more, you have, you have to sign up and buy. Um, and that's, that seems to be quite successful. We Maybe not fantastically successful because the New York Times won't tell us how much money they're getting, uh, but they do say they've got 650,000 subscribers, which is not bad. But once you've made something free, it's very hard then to get people to pay for it. Yes, but I think that the fact is that in the future, most internet models for journalism are going to be a, a, a subscription-based system. They, they, they have to be. They are. Um, if you don't keep a, a sort of newsroom type journalism going, then a lot of things finish. You know, the, the lots and lots and lots of bloggers of various sources in the world, but 
anyone who's blogging on serious subjects is relying on the information that comes from newsrooms in the first instance for, as their information, their raw material that they, that they play around with. We have news uh, uh, aggregators like uh, Google News and Yahoo. Now, where would Yahoo and Google News be if there were no more newsrooms? They wouldn't exist. You wouldn't be able to go to Google News and get your news, your news for free if there were no more newsrooms. Well, one thing you can guarantee about the future of journalism and the internet uh, and print media is that it's going to be vastly different tomorrow than it is today and even more different in a week's time, in 10 years' time. And We really don't know exactly where it's going to go, do we? And that's, that's exactly right. I, I think two things about this. One is we take the humble mobile phone, now, now a humble mobile phone, you know, something like a um, Samsung Galaxy Psalm 3 or an iPhone 5. You go on a PC, you've got to recognise you're on a PC or present the news in that format. You go with your iPad or a similar, it'll recognise it's a, it's a pad device, it'll shape the, the page accordingly. Page accordingly. Yeah. It'll recognise a phone and if you even go on with an old fashioned little Nokia, old fashioned Nokia, you know, as long as it's web-enabled, it'll recognise that and shape to that as well. Yeah. Now that's pretty. That's pretty clever, and that's that's fairly also fairly recent. Uh, we, if we were talking, if we'd had this conversation three years ago, we wouldn't talk about that. We wouldn't have even predicted it. Right. Yeah. So who knows what it's going to be like yeah. in five or ten years' time? Well, I think you just said it when you mentioned Nokia. Ten years ago, they were the uh, the mobile product, uh, manufacturing company. Yes. These days. Who's Nokia? That's right. And if you said 10 years ago that Apple were going to be making phones and be the biggest manufacturer of mobile phones in the world, no, no. It's they're exciting, just, isn't they're it? Just, they're just for uh, you know, creative artists doing the math. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yes. It and, is exciting. And they still are. Yes. <laughs> David Armstrong, pleasure to meet you. Pleased to meet you, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you. David Armstrong joining us on Phuket in Focus. We could have gone on for hours. Yeah.